So does anyone, uh, can anyone think about what a monthly task might be as a DBA that uh, you should be doing in the organisation? Who's got a monthly checklist at the moment? What about things like capacity planning? Things like performance, being actually able to have a look at, okay, these, this used to be my top 10 worst performing queries. This is now my top 10 worst performing queries. Why is that the case? Why have we actually gone and changed the footprint of our SQL Server instance? Is it because that we've had additional workload, we've made a merger and acquisition so there's more users using it that's caused that? What is it? Or is it that there's something wrong with my server? So a great example, we were working with an organization recently, and they actually had one of the new Butte servers, all of the monitoring and alerts and everything like that. One of their banks of memory had actually died. So they were getting this red alarm coming up all the time and then monitoring. They go, oh, look, it must be broken. Let's just ignore all that. And it wasn't until they came around to their monthly task to have a look at what was going on from a query performance that they saw this dramatic degradation that they hadn't seen. And that red alarm was actually going off for a reason. And that's because that memory bank had actually died in that server. So effectively, they were running at half the speed that they should be. So these monthly tasks are designed to go and identify things like that from a capacity planning and also a performance perspective as well. It's also an opportunity for you then going back and look through all of your help desk tickets as well. Are there any patterns that are occurring here? Is it every Thursday that I'm being called up for performance issues? That ability to sort of sit back and actually sharpen the axe is really what we want to be able to do is in our monthly tasks to see how do we then go and get this continual improvement across our entire SQL Server fleet. Because as we said before, if we're not doing these tasks, really we should be out there looking in the paper, looking in our technology career section, maybe in Tuesday's age, and seeing what else is actually available out there. Because eventually this stuff is going to come and catch up on us and we're going to get bitten where we don't want to be bitten. So what do we do when we've got a performance problem here? Well, how do we identify a performance problem? Does anyone want to share with me how we'd identify some performance problems? Because I think there's one good indicator. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're the best barometer of performance inside of an organization. I've never had a user come up to me and say, great job, the performance is fantastic, you're doing an awesome job, keep it up. But I've certainly had plenty of people come up to me and want to go and kick me in the agoulies and go and say, look, the performance of this is absolutely rubbish, fix it now. So as DBAs, we want to start to be proactive about this. We don't want to get the call from the help desk. We want to actually be responding and identifying those performance issues before the phone has even started to ring or even weeks or months in advance of when the issue actually occurs. Because there's a number of things that we can go and identify with performance. And these are some of the things that you'll see. And it doesn't matter what tool set that you're looking at, you'll start to see these. So you'll see resource bottlenecks. You'll see high CPU utilization, for example. Now, why is high CPU utilization an issue? What is the CPU inside of a computer? It's, it's the engine. It's the central core engine. If it's not doing anything, then happy days. Think about your car. If you're sitting at the lights, it's sitting there idling. Are you putting any pressure on the engine at all? Basically, you're not putting any pressure. In fact, if you're driving a Prius, your engine's probably turned off. So as I start to put the accelerator down, what starts to happen? Well, we start to actually then increase the pressure that's on that engine. So if I kept pushing that through to the floor and all of a sudden I see that my tachometer is going 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 RPM, what do you think is happening to that engine? Yeah, we're stressing it and there's certainly a level of stress that a CPU can take. And there's a great story I, I tell about at a company that I uh, did some consulting for about seven years ago. We're actually doing a data migration project. It was Friday afternoon. We all just wanted to go to the pub and grab a few beers, as you do. It'd be very, very long hours. We wanted to go and test the migration process. So we realized that there were some issues. So one of my colleagues that was sitting next to me said, look, I'll just make this one change. We'll run it overnight. We're all coming back in tomorrow. We'll see how it goes. No worries at all. He went and made that change. We then went out for a couple of beers, came in the office about 9 o'clock the next morning. And you know that smell of electricity we go, What's that smell? This is actually a true story. He actually cooked the two CPUs that were sitting inside of that 2RU server. When he changed the query, all of a sudden it became a cross-join. 
it was a cross join with two tables that had 1.6 billion records. So all of a sudden the CPU went through the roof, the temperature detection device inside of this server didn't kick in, so they cooked that CPU. So CPUs are really good indication from a SQL Server perspective of what the workload is. Because if CPU is very, very low, really, SQL's not doing a lot at all. There's no computational work. It's not having to go and use the query execution plan to execute queries. So you want to take a very, very close look at that resource bottleneck. Because the obvious ones we've got is memory and I.O. Because SQL Server is a database engine after all, so it's going to be very, very I.O. intensive. But why should it be I.O. intensive? Should it be? Or should it be memory intensive? Yeah, well, we want to actually get it off disk and actually be reading directly out of memory. We want to make sure that we're not having to go back to disk to go and read all of those requests. Because if you think about what SQL Server is, it's nothing more than an MDF file. We might have a couple of uh, other data files, so NDF files, as well as our log file. It's sitting on disk there. So if you go open up Windows Explorer, you'll see that you've got that gigabyte or terabyte file that's sitting there. So what SQL Server's having to do is read the data that's stored inside of that. It certainly does it very efficiently and get that into memory. And you want to keep it in memory as long as possible. So you want to start to look at some of those counters that then indicate, okay, how much paging is happening? What's the page life expectancy? Because page life expectancy indicates how long that page, so that 8K chunk of SQL Server data, is actually sitting in memory. The higher that is, the better the performance that we're going to start to get from our SQL Server. The other common thing that we start to see when our servers are under stress is we start to see TempDB performance issues. Now, if we think our minds back to earlier versions of SQL Server, TempDB was really used for nothing more than simply a scratch pad. So when we went and created temporary tables, it was utilized then. It was used for a couple of internal processes as well. But if you think about where we are with SQL Server 2008, TempDB is used extensively. When we're doing order buys, it's used by there. When we're doing database snapshots, it goes and uses TempDB. When we're using different types of isolation levels as well from a locking mechanism, it's using TempDB. So that's a really good sign to start to look at that maybe we've got some performance bottlenecks over here because our TempDB utilization is increasing. Now, there's a number of things that we can do to alleviate that performance. Now, I want to do a quick straw poll. Who's got one data file for TempDB? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so if we think about our modern servers that we've got today, we've got dual core, we've got quad core, but what we want to think about is how many sockets do we actually, so that's the physical CPUs do we have inside of our machines. Because what we want to do is we want to align the number of physical CPUs to the number of data files that we have with TempDB, because what we want to be able to do is improve the parallelism that we have, so being able to write across multiple data files inside of TempDB. So if I've got two physical sockets, what I want to have is I want to have two TempDB data files, so I want to align that. So that assists to remediate some of those performance issues that we may have with TempDB. But look, as we said earlier, really the biggest indication that we've got performance issues is that we've got slow queries. Slow queries affect our applications, they affect our users, hence our users then start complaining that we've got an issue here and we want to go and address that particular issue. Because I'm sure many of you have seen the hockey stick graph of how you actually go about getting performance gains. You can go and increase memory, you can go and increase disk utilization, yes, you're going to get a little bit of performance increase. You can go and upgrade SQL or Windows, yes, you're going to get a little bit of performance increase. But really, I don't know about you guys as DBAs, but my SQL Server runs perfectly until I put an application on it. It just sits there over in the corner and hums along. So what's causing all of this stress is my applications. So that's really what I want to focus the attention on is how do I go about identifying these bottlenecks from an application very easily. Now if we think back to SQL 2000, who's running SQL 2000 still? You poor souls, you guys realize that it is no longer going to be supported full stop all over Red Rover, don't even bother calling anybody in April 2013. That is not extended support, the whole kit and caboodle, it's all over. So now's the time to start to think about moving from SQL 2000 up to higher versions. 
The other challenge that you want to start to think about is many of you might have heard of SQL Server Denali. So Denali is the next release of SQL Server. Now if you look at what the release cycle is for SQL Server, we're getting a major release every three years, we're getting a minor release every 18 months. So Denali is pretty close on the horizon when you start to look at that. One of the challenges that we're going to have with Denali is we're not going to be able to do an in-place upgrade. We can't go from SQL 2000 directly to Denali. So now we need to start to think about doing an interim step. So down the track, you're going to be in a position where you're going to have to go to 2008 R2 or 2008 and then to Denali. So you want to basically try and alleviate the need to do that right now. So the other thing and the reason I talk about SQL 2000 is I haven't used SQL 2000 for a long period of time, I must have to admit. It's been quite a while. I try to actually pass that off to other people in the organisation and that's one of the joys of being the boss is being able to go, oh, SQL 2000. I don't want to have a look at this. But I was working with a customer site the other day. I've got basically what I call a server takedown script, and I'll take you through that. So my server takedown script is as soon as I walk into a customer, I want to take down that service. You know, Chuck Norris, take down. So basically what I want to do is identify what's going on on that server very quickly. So I pull up my little uh, arsenal of scripts that I've got, open it up, and press execute. And all of a sudden it says, object does not exist object doesn't exist, who's been playing with my scripts? I'm going through, oh yeah, and DMV, oh yeah, that's all good. Run it again, object doesn't exist. And all of a sudden I realise it's on SQL 2000. So if I'm running SQL 2000, how do I identify the top 10 worst performing queries? How do you got, well, come on guys, you're still running 2000. Seriously, guys, how, how, do you, how do you go and find what are the top 10 worst performing queries in SQL 2000? Yeah, but how do I find them? How do I find what's causing the problem? Are you guys running traces all the time on your boxes, you know, continually 24-7? The problem is I've already got the call in. By the time it's come through the help desk to me, the problem's already disappeared. And I'm looking at, oh, how am I going to identify where that issue is? Because in SQL 2000, the only mechanism that we had to identify poor performing queries was retrospectively, unless we were running a trace continually to identify that. So we'd have to go and take a SQL trace, we'd have to go and analyse that. So SQL 2005 introduced this whole concept of what they call the dynamic management views. So the dynamic management views gives us a very, very deep insight of what's happening under the covers with SQL Server. And the analogy that I use all the time is going to my mechanic. So look, if I go and take my car to the mechanic and say, look, it's making a bit of noise there, the mechanic doesn't walk around and stick his head up the exhaust pipe, go around, kick the back tyre, and maybe there's a problem there. Of course not. What he does is he drives it up, he lifts the hood up, he goes and connects the computer up, and it does all of the diagnostics information for him and identifies, okay, we need to go and change the spark plugs, there's a problem with the aspiration on the turbo, there's an issue there that we've got. He doesn't have to go through that process of elimination. Straight away, that diagnostic utility has identified where the issue is. So it's allowed them to triage the issue. Probably still charge me lots of money for it, but he's been able to get there very, uh, very quickly to identify and isolate where the issue was. And that's what we want to demonstrate today, is how we can go and start using some of those techniques inside of SQL Server 2008 R2.